Um, thank you. Um, and then my, our next speaker is Mick Burke from <coughs> Economists Against Austerity and Socialist Economic Policy. Um, thanks very much, and thanks very much to the organisers of this for inviting me to speak. I was very much reminded yesterday of um, seeing Tony Benn, and uh, that's always a delight, um, of something he always used to say at meetings, uh, especially when he was a minister a long time ago now, but subsequently, he used to say that he used to approach people on the basis of the questions of who are you, um, what do you represent, who appointed you, and how can I get rid of you? Um, which I think is a good, a good sort of approach. So on that basis, I'd better explain what Economists Against Austerity is very, very briefly. Um, it's very young uh, grouping. It's a network. It doesn't have a particular view. It says it is what it says on the tin. It's Economists who are against austerity. It's had two meetings. That's all. Uh, both at the House of Commons, uh, where there were. 40 and 30 people at, uh, including up to nine MPs, and I think I was one of two economists in the room who weren't uh, professors. Um, and the purpose of it really is to bolster the MPs uh, who want to argue against austerity with, it, with <coughs> arguments um, uh, on that basis. And I'm very pleased to report that there are a number of Labour MPs and also Caroline Lucas at both meetings and relations were very friendly on both sides, which is not always the case with people I find in the, the Labour Party, <coughs> but speakers of member, um, towards other progressive forces like the Greens. Um, and I hope at a future date that those numbers will grow and will perhaps include people I've applied um, in it as well, maybe others, who knows. Um, so that's that's what it is. Uh, and the. Because of setting that up and the way these things go, you know, viral would be too strong a word, could it would really imply that there are lots of people. Um, it got passed on, um, the establishment of it, and uh, uh, there was a much bigger network in France called Les Economies d'Atelier, which some, some of you may know, um, who invited us to the, um, to the Alter Summit. Um, so that's 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 the, the background. The what I want to speak about is uh, one specific thing at the Alter Summit, and it's something I've had a little association with in the past, um, which is a grouping in the European Parliament called, uh, well, in English the G U E N G L, but everyone else calls it the GUE. Um, it just doesn't sound right in English, um, and that brings together the various left parties, or many of the left parties, who are represented in the European Parliament um, at a European level. Those that are in effect, they've, they're not the traditional <coughs> socialist or social democrat parties and that have broken from them or in some way are not them uh, and are generally very militantly against austerity. And they had a meeting at the Alter Summit and I, the reason that I raise it is because I think they're going to be an increasingly important part of the European scene as austerity deepens. Um, the composition will change dramatically of course in relation to the next <coughs> European elections um, and in particular Syriza will have a much bigger re representation than they do now. I think they have one MEP currently. And the point of that is that's going to be I think <coughs> one of the pivots, not the sole pivot, one of the pivots of coordination of people who are against austerity at a political level. <coughs> and that's going to be important because austerity and the economic crisis is going to continue. The, there's a lot of boosterism taking place currently which suggests that the crisis is over. And you'll find in many countries um, the media and representatives of the governments carrying out austerity and their supporters, <coughs> seizing on one or two you know, minor aspects of economic data to suggest that the uh, situation is improving. <laughs> um, country that I, in terms of the economy and political life, I follow closely in relation to Ireland, and there we've turned the corner so many times, it's dizzying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and the reality is that the European economy is contracting. 
it's actually the main drag on world growth, and world growth is slowing. Um, so the crisis is deepening in Europe, and it's having a global, uh, negative global um, economic effect. The basis of that crisis is um, an investment strike. That's true in the whole of the OECD economies. It's true however way you carve up the, um, the European economies and whatever grouping. In terms of, just to give numbers, I want to sort of have a barrage of numbers. In terms of numbers, in, if we look at the um, euro area, euro area GDP has fallen from the beginning of 2008 to the beginning of 2013 by 288 billion euros. The fall in investment, and by that I mean investment in plant and equipment and machinery and housing, I don't mean speculation. The fall in investment, or what economists call, you know, mainstream economists call gross fixed capital formation, that's fallen by 310 billion in the euro. Oh, it's bigger. Yeah, it more than accounts for the whole of the recession. And this is pretty much true in almost every single country in the euro area. And the same picture is true if we take the EU as a whole. Um, the numbers there are GDP has fallen um, by 310 billion euros and gross fixed capital formation has fallen by 461 billion euros. Now, th so in all cases, it's the f decline in investment. In effect, an investment strike by capital. Capital has been hoarded because the profits have fallen and they refuse to invest. Their purpose in life is not to make widgets or cans or <coughs> beans. The purpose is to make profits. And if they can't make profits or profit rate falls, then they'll stop making things. They'll stop investing. Uh, and that's what's happened. That accounts for the recession. <coughs> that, I think, tells us something that's quite important politically, um, both as it relates to the GUE NGL grouping of left parties, but also the wider uh, movement. And that is we have to address the crisis of investment, uh, the investment strike. And there was a thing put out last year, which I think was very helpful in this respect, uh, by the German Trade Union Federation, the DGB, with, with its Marshall Plan for Europe. Now, I don't think it's by any means a perfect document, but what's very, very good about it uh, and quite unusual is it poses Europe-wide answers to what is a Europe-wide crisis. It talks about the need for a European-wide investment program. So it's, you know, it addresses the scope of the crisis and it addresses the specific nature of it. And that's very positive and it has some, I think, helpful suggestions. And something I looked up because of their, um, what they what they had written. Uh, and they said, uh, they talked about the European Investment Bank and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And what happened is during the crisis, the member countries who subscribed the capital to those, uh, in effect, state or supranational investment banks, um, they increased the capital of both, both those, the EIB and the EBRD, and uh, simultaneously cut the level of investment. So, i.e., they've got enormous scope to increase investment. The reason they don't, the reason, for example, governments like our own in Britain cut investment is because they are getting out of the way of the capitalists. They're privatising things. They're handing over what all the state already does to private capital to boost profits. They're not in the business currently of investing, which would interfere with private capital. So that's why so there's a scope there. They also have some stuff about the financial transaction tax funding. Um, the investment program, which I think is problematic to say the least. Uh, it's a bit like having the tax on smoking to fund the NHS. <laughs> it's, a, it's a conflict there, clearly. But just that aside, I think it's very positive. So I think those types of developments are, are very good. But of course, all these um, battles are fought out at the national level to some extent. They're each specific, as Chris said, there's a, there's a specific. Is it possible for you to simplify your language so everyone? <coughs> comes from working in a jargon laden <laughs> environment. Sorry. Um, yes, I'll try. Um, all, all these struggles are at a national level. There's, we're not going to get, you know, with a magic wave of a magic wand, we're not going to get a European wide answer to the crisis. And that's why I think it's very important that we learn from each other and from each other's struggles. And on that, I'll finish with two points. 
Firstly, I think there's a very strong and direct relationship by the willingness of all forces or all political parties to be more or less against or in favour of austerity and the degree to which they fight racism. I think there's a direct correlation between the two. It's a bit of an either or. Either you're anti-austerity and anti-racist in the current environment, or you're not so much. Or actually you're promoting austerity and you're promoting racism. And there's a very good reason for that. It's a huge distraction. <coughs> it's, a huge, it's blaming another enemy um, rather than the enemy which is how things are actually currently uh, constructed. So all across Europe there are all sorts of targets in terms of uh, Roma, in terms of migrant workers, in terms of black people, but of course most especially in many countries against Muslims. And that's the key sort of driving attack uh, that people are using. So that, I think that's, that's firstly the important, important thing to say. And, yeah, and then very lastly, learning from each other. Um, I think the political parties that are represented in GUV and GEL, which has the clearest answer at the national level to its own economic crisis is Sinn Féin. Uh, it's got a very clear line in terms of investment, not cuts, and how to fund it. And I think it's, if people study, it, the, the obligation in Ireland, in the South, is that you have to make pre-budget submissions, so Sinn Féin does that every year. And actually, it's really clear how they see their way out of the economic crisis. So I think people can learn from that. Our final speaker in this session, um, before we open up to the floor, is Felipe Van Kriesfeld from Belgium. Thank you, Jude, and thank you for the organizers. Uh, first, I apologize for my bad English. And second, as Jude said, uh, on the agenda I am mentioned as CADDM. I am a single member of the CADDM, but I'm mainly here as a uh, working as the General Secretary of the uh, Trade Union in Belgium, part of the main trade union in Belgium, counting with 1.7 million members. But uh, I was one of the animators of this art summit process. And I think this is why I was invited here. Um, quickly, uh, what were the two reasons why we launched the Artists Summit process one year ago. It was two statements. Uh, the first is very known, and so I will be quick, is that we are living the worst crisis since World War II. And it's not a debt crisis. As you all know, debt level has been higher in the past. Debt level is very higher in Japan than in Europe. That level is never the problem. The problem is relationship with markets and the way in which debt is financed. So it's not a debt crisis. Neither is it a job crisis or an unemployment crisis. Of course, we have a huge level of unemployment, but that's a consequence, not a cause. So we are certainly not in a crisis caused by the unemployment.